So I want to open with two quotations written in the mid-19th century from two men writing in London, uh, two different visions of intellectual life and, by extension, visions of what a university should be. So first, uh, John Stuart Mill, his famous, uh, his famous uh, line from On Liberty, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. And of course, Mill and On Liberty was just brilliant at understanding the limitations of human reasoning, how biased and flawed and often shallow and silly we are, but when we push against each other, we challenge each other and we get better, we get smarter together. On this view of human nature, on this view of intellectual life, a university must have viewpoint diversity, and it dies. It dies if it has political orthodoxy and a monoculture. Now, here's a very different view. <clears throat> uh, so this is an internet meme. The point is not merely to understand the world. The point is to change it. The actual quote is pretty much, I mean, the, the real quote is basically that in spirit. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Now, that can be very inspiring to an undergraduate, but is that really the point of intellectual life? Is that what professors should be focused on? Uh, this kind of viewpoint leads to the idea that the university is there to challenge privilege and power and um, um, viewpoint diversity, political diversity, would just get in the way. When I showed up at Yale in 1981, here's what it said over the doorway. It said, lux et veritas, so truth as the talos, the purpose, the goal of the university was very clear and explicit. But over, uh, over the time that I've been in the academic world, the talos at many schools has been gradually changing to more the, the, the Marxist one of change. The point of this place is to change the world, and not just change in general, but social justice in particular. Um, now, um, I'm going to argue, uh, and I've been arguing publicly in the last month or two, that what we need is a schism. We must separate the universities into those that are pursuing uh, social justice, and Brown has volunteered to take the leadership position on that, um, <laughs> and those that are going to devote themselves to pursuing truth as their talos, and Chicago has, has volunteered to take the leadership position on that. Um, so this is, these slides are taken. I just gave a talk at Duke a few weeks ago. It just came, went up online. It's, my, it's like an hour-long talk, but it lays out exactly what I think has gone wrong and what we need to do. But here's the, the key idea. The reason why we need this schism is this one piece of psychology. Um, so motivated reasoning. I'm a social psychologist. I study more, uh, morality, moral judgment, moral reasoning. The basic rule is this. We don't look out at the world and say, where's the weight of the evidence? We start with an initial supposition, and we say, can I believe it? If I want to believe something, I ask, can I believe it? Can I find a justification? But if I don't want to believe it, I start by saying, must I believe it? Am I forced to believe it, or can I escape? So just to give you one example, in a classic study, students come into the lab. Uh, they are taking psychology classes. They are learning about experimental methods. So they're given a study. It looks like it's from the journal Science. And they're asked to critique the methods. And the study seems to show that caffeine consumption is associated with breast cancer. And your job now is to read the study and say, what do you think of the methods? Well, who do you think finds a lot of flaws in that study? Who do you think? Coffee drinkers. Do you think all coffee drinkers are trying to find flaws in the study? Women who drink coffee are desperately saying, must I believe it? Must I believe it? What could possibly be wrong? And they find all kinds of things wrong with it. The others say, oh, gosh, OK, I didn't know that. Um, so this is called motivated reasoning. And there's great research from Dan Kahan at Yale that scholars and experts are just as subject to this problem, and sometimes more so. The more you know about a field, the easier you can find post hoc justifications for whatever you want to believe. So motivated scholarship is the rule throughout the academy. Uh, if, what, if a scholar undertakes research in order to support a political agenda, she or he is almost guaranteed to succeed um, and to believe that she or he is not biased. Motivated scholarship puts things out there. A weak study with a small sample size will get propagated across the academy, across the world. Very difficult to recall if it's disproven, because if people want to believe it, they will. Now, there's one major protection we have against this. It's called institutionalized disconfirmation. This is the reason why science is so great. This was the discovery that Europeans made in their coffee shops and communities of gentlemen scholars reading each other's papers and publishing letters. The community of science is a community devoted to institutionalized disconfirmation. We're all motivated, but if 
I'm motivated to disprove you, and you're motivated to disprove me, we get the John Stuart Mill phenomenon, and the truth emerges. But that doesn't happen anymore in politicized areas. This is data that should scare the hell out of you. This is data that you might not know. I didn't know it until two years ago. What this is, this is data from uh, Higher Education Research Institute. This is nationally representative data of uh, professors at American universities. As late as the mid-1990s, the left to right ratio was only two to one. The blue line is people who self-identify as being on the far left or left, and the red line is, is uh, right or far right. And the purple line in the middle is moderates. So, and this is all department. This includes the agriculture school, the dental school, everything. So two to one, left to right. Um, but just 15 years later, it had changed to five to one. Five to one. And again, this includes all the professional schools. If you focus on the core areas of the humanities and social sciences, which is where most of the concern is on our panel and the previous panel, what do you find? Well, I can show you the data from my field, psychology, and it's the same story in the others. Uh, so I published a paper with some colleagues uh, two years ago on how the uh, homogeneity damages our research. We put together all the research we could find. What you see is that in 1960, there was a study that looked at who professors of psychology voted for, and four to one, they went for Kennedy. Now, then they were asked to recall, who did you vote for previously? And as you see, roughly two to one, they went for the Democrat. Right? So psychologists have always leaned left politically. As late as 1996, so the diamonds are party, who you voted for. The circles are left, right, or liberal conservative. So as late as 1996, psychologists were only four to one, left to right, professors of psychology. But again, between the mid-90s and 2010, everything changes, and the numbers go up and up and up, and just last week or two weeks ago, we got a new data point from Langbert et al, 17 to one. 17 to one, and I know the one guy. He's a really nice guy. <laughs> Okay, so this is happening in, throughout the humanities and social sciences, and even to some extent in the sciences now. This has many, many profound and threatening implications for students and for faculty. For students, what this means is that orthodox views become strongly held, but weakly supported. They actually can't even justify the beliefs they hold so passionately because they've never been challenged. And what that means is that if anybody comes close to challenging, it's very threatening. A phrase they use is, you are invalidating my existence. If you challenge a proposition that I hold dear, you are invalidating my existence. So students are afraid to do so, and I, I hear all over the place, students say it's kind of boring in seminar classes. No one will disagree. And many students become intellectually fragile from the lack of challenge, and that's why when a, when a controversial speaker comes to campus, they don't just not go, they don't argue back, they have to come together to get the, student, the speaker banned, or they do a protest to drown him or her out. For faculty, of course, this has many implications, misallocation of effort, loss of rigor in our thinking, fear of dissent, and recently, just the last two or three years, fear of our students. One of the reasons the comment was made that faculty lack courage, that's absolutely true, now we're actually quite afraid of our students because it's so easy for them. We're really busy, and at the drop of a hat, if, any, if we offend anyone in the class, it could be months of hearings. They can go right to the Equal Opportunity Commission. It's a nightmare, and so we're all afraid of our students. This is why I founded, uh, with my colleagues who wrote that paper, um, Heterodox Academy. I urge you all to go to hetero heterodoxacademy.org. It's the opposite of Orthodox Academy. <laughs> Um, and if you are a professor, if you are, whether you're tenured or untenured, if you, have a, uh, um, uh, if you are a tenured or tenure track professor, please join. Um, we have 220 professors now uh, from all fields um, who have come together to say, we actually think that there should be some viewpoint diversity. We think that's important. I just want to share with you our most important project, and this is why I came down here from New York, because we need the help of the trustees and alumni. Here's what we did. Um, th we just put this out last week. We took the top 150 schools from the US News rankings. And um, you know, great, you want to know, you, know you, want, you want a school that has a small faculty to student ratio? Well, you know, US News will factor that in. But what if you actually want to be exposed to viewpoint diversity? What if you want your child to not just be in an indoctrination mill? How can you find out where to go? You can't. Until two weeks ago, you can go to the Heterodox Academy Guide to Colleges, and we've quantified did they endorse, has the school passed a resolution endorsing Chicago? What does FIRE say about them? What does ISI say about them? And what's been happening in the news that gives us an indication? And here's the rankings. Uh, we put it on a zero to 100 scale. 
And Chicago uh, tops the list. Um, so Chicago, Purdue, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Princeton is by far the best Ivy. It's the only Ivy that has any claim to promote viewpoint diversity. So these are what appear to be the good schools. Uh, now this is our first pass. We're gonna bring in a lot more data. Uh, we're, gonna, we're coding now whether the school has a BRT, a bias response team, an Orwellian way that you can, if you hear a joke someplace, there's, there's a website you go to, you report them, and then they get visited by an administrator. So that's coming, that's at a lot of schools. So if they have that, we're gonna really p penalize them. Um, what, about the, uh, uh, what about the bottom? So you can sort by any column if you sort uh, by ranking. Now the worst schools in the country uh, on our first pass are Missouri and uh, Oregon, uh, followed by Brown, and, so, and those are all in a tie. Brown, Georgetown, Harvard, NYU, a bunch of others are down there, six points out of 100. So we hope our goal is to make this a major leverage point for alumni and trustees, because what I'm finding is that the big donors have not stopped giving. They call up the president, they say, hey, what's going on? I really care about freedom of speech. And the president reassures them, don't worry, we've got it under control, we're doing this and that. Oh, okay. That's what, yeah, that's right. <laughs> they are under control, that's right. So uh, I'm really hoping, I've been working with, with ACTA, to, to try to give donors a clear stop and go signal. Make your, make your gifts conditional on them making progress on this metric. Um, so to conclude, there are two very different views of what a university should be um, based on these two ideas. I think uh, the only viable form for a university that will be a benefit to the public, that will actually uh, bring us forward in finding truth is one based on John Stuart Mill's principles. And then I'll just end, I'll just put this up here. This is at Heterodox Academy, we have a business plan. This is our stakeholder analysis. This is how, what we see happening. Um, I'm in a business school now, so I'm learning how to do stakeholder analyses. I thought, let me try it here, it works pretty well. So if you think about the president and the administration in the center, there are a lot of stakeholders. There are a lot of people who care about what the university does. And what you see here is in green are the people who generally care about free speech and free inquiry. So the, the people in the community, most Americans, as one person said before, most Americans are, don't like what's going on on the universities. The alumni, uh, prospective students generally. So most people uh, out there outside the university are our allies. The yellow region are the people on campus, and that's where the problem is. On campus, you have staff, and you have many staff that are devoted to diversity and inclusion, worthy goals, but if you say all that matters is diversity and inclusion, therefore we don't want any ideas that could upset people. So in red are the people who I think are opposed to uh, freedom of, of inquiry and freedom of expression on campus. Um, uh, and so you see that in the faculty, the humanities are generally on the other side, as we saw at Yale, uh, 400 uh, humanities faculty rushed to support the protesters and condemn the Christakis's. Uh, the science faculty are overwhelmingly on our side on this. Um, it took a month, but uh, 40 professors a month later um, put their names up saying that they supported the Christakis's, 40, and they were almost all in the natural sciences or they were in the Christakis's home departments. And guess what? The Yale students come back saying, those scientists, they need retraining. They need re-education. They're insensitive. So again, faculty are afraid to stand up. The red line is what we call the... Um, um, the what do we call it, the axis of uh, something or other. Oh, we had a catchy name for it. But the point is that uh, the federal government, the Department of Education, Department of Justice, are really putting the screws on universities to, uh, to crack down on any case where someone feels marginalized, and that leads them to these excessive procedures. Um, the axis of outrage, I'm sorry, that's it. So there's an axis of outrage in which ideas propagated in the studies departments of the humanities spread to the, the social justice warrior students, um, supported by the diversity and therapy staff uh, with pressure from the DOE and DOJ. So that's the situation, and that's why we think the solution, well, there's many, you have to do many things, but basically we have to empower or strengthen the people in green and break up the axis of outrage. And if alumni, alumni are the most powerful force here, if the alumni will give to schools that are doing a good job of it and tell the president directly, I am no longer giving. Until you work on this problem, I will not give any more money. When that happens, I think we'll start to see change. Thank you.